Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait for everyone to get into the room, and then we're going to get started here. All right, starting to slow down a bit, so I think we're probably there. How many registered, Julie? 20 something. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Markle, Executive Director of the Barry Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to thank you to, uh, for coming to today's session, effectively leading your team through the vaccine passport rollout. So this is uh, the second, uh, you know, sort of installment that we've, uh, we're doing today um, on this particular subject. But we're going to start with a land acknowledgement, and then uh, we'll move on from there. So I'd like to, uh, in, in keeping with Indigenous protocols and building respectful relationships uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada, it's customary to acknowledge the traditional territories and ancestral lands of the Indigenous peoples. The Barry Chamber acknowledges that this land we operate on um, has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. This is the ancestral land of the Wendat and the Anishinaabek Nation. The treaties that were signed for this particular parcel of land are the Williams Treaty, Robinson Superior Treaty Number 60, Penetanguishene Purchase Number 5, and the Nanawasaga Purchase Number 18. We're dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture, we also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land, and we're committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect. Miigwech. So over the past year and a half, we've, with every business in Ontario has been repeatedly uh, asked to change the way they work to align with evolving government and safety restrictions. Making adjustments to policies and protocols, particularly when it comes to personal health and privacy concerns, is always daunting. Business owners have asked many questions about how to best ensure that their staff and customers are safe, while managing staff and customer expectations and working within the law. So during this webinar, experts will speak about how to properly implement new policies and protocols, how to prepare your employees and manage customer interactions, and how to keep lines of communication open with your employees through changing expectations and legal requirements. Should be aware, uh, uh, you should be aware of as an employer. Um, our experts will also touch on uh, the effects that the pandemic has had on the mental well-being of employees and employers. So this is going to be kind of a, a, an open format conversation today with uh, our experts, and I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. Um, but I'd like you to get your questions in early if you can. The Q&A button is where I'd like you to put them. Um, if you have any housekeeping issues, uh, you just want to put a comment in or say hi, put it into the chat. But any questions need to go into the Q&A because that's where we'll be working from. Um, but again, this is just going to be an open conversation. So, you know, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, there's no dumb questions out there. We're trying to get the, the best uh, advice we can with our ex experts today, and we don't want to waste time, so we felt that getting to the Q&A was more important. So with us today is Michelle Newton, speaker, um, expert, and advocate. Uh, Michelle uh, Newton is renowned communicator turned speaker, advocate, and educational consultant, driving inclusion and belonging, a public relations and communications expert with over 25 years of experience. She provides unique insights and leading expertise through the equity lens. Thank thanks and welcome, uh, Michelle. We also have Josh Valor with us from Barriston Law. Josh is a senior associate lawyer um, at Barriston Law, practicing the areas of employment law and civil and commercial litigation. And since the beginning of the pandemic, Josh has been uh, committed to providing up-to-date information surrounding employment law and, and COVID in the business community. And he's been a speaker with us many times and we uh, welcome him back. Um, and joining us uh, again is Cheryl Claringbold from HR Performance and Results. Uh, as a HR partner, Cheryl uh, provides a full complement of services and support to our clients at the senior level from complex advisory services conducting workplace hazard uh, has harassment in investigations um, to developing and implementing human resource and health and safety programs. So um, three great experts and uh, a talking head in the middle. So uh, with that, let's uh, we're going to go <laughs> kick it off to Josh. Um, he's going to lead us off and then we'll just uh, we'll just sort of have a great conversation and we'll get to some Q&A really quick. Well, thanks, Paul, and thanks to uh, the Chamber of Commerce for Barry for uh, having us today. It's great to be back uh, giving another webinar on this really, uh, you know, developing and important issue for a lot of our businesses in town and a lot of employees in town, because this is something that impacts everyone's day-to-day -day life. And there's been a lot of changes and a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what are rights of employees, what are the rights of employers, and that's one of the things that I know, uh, you know, Cheryl and myself have both been busy with from different aspects, as well as Michelle, I'm sure, uh, dealing with different facets of that and helping employers and employees cope with the, the new normal as, as you know, I, I hate to say it, that's what it is, but it seems right now to be that new normal 
especially with the vaccine rollout and a lot of uh, vaccination passports being required for a lot of businesses, as well as uh, employers looking to implement their own vaccination policies, even if it's not required uh, at this point of them from the government. Uh, they want to know, you know, what are their obligations as employers are, and that's a really important question. Um, you know, and you know, it's one that a lot of my clients ask me. Uh, I'd say on a daily basis is, well, I, I want to be fair to my employees, but I also need to make sure that they're protected. What are my obligations? What are you know? What are the things that I can do in this? And I always remind them that they have an obligation to provide a safe uh, uh, workplace for their employees and for their clients. And part of providing that safe workplace is have, ensuring that um, you, know, you have proper policies and processes in place to deal with the rollout of the vaccination um, and to incorporate those into your policies in the workplace. And I, I know Cheryl's been busy helping employers with developing their vaccination policies as well. And dealing with kind of the fallout that or some of the pushback that might come from employees who are, you know, vaccination hesitant or, or concerned about their privacy rights and their rights to have autonomy over their own bodies. And it's really important to highlight that no employer can force an employee to get a vaccination. But what you can do is require an employee to get vaccinated in order to continue working in your organization, at least in person unless they uh, require accommodations for a protected ground under the Human Rights Code. And this was uh, highlighted by the Ontario Human Rights uh, Commission, actually, uh, not about a week ago on September 22nd, uh, where they came out with a policy statement outlining that employers have the right to mandate, uh, vaccine uh, you know, mandate vaccines for their employees, as long as there's accommodations made for people who require accommodations on the basis of some code protected ground. The two that I see quite frequently being relied upon are medical exemptions, um, you know, in, in which case the employee would be required or expected to provide uh, medical documentation outlining why they can't receive uh, a vaccination and providing that, you know, from, from their treating physician or based on creed or personal belief. And right now the Human Rights Code or Commission rather is, is kind of coming out more in favor of the medical exemption uh, they're saying that uh, if based on my re research and review of the law, it would be exceedingly difficult to, to succeed on a, uh, a claim on the basis of uh, some sort of violation of an individual's personally or personal beliefs. But again, this is in kind of a, a weird time for the employment bar because we haven't seen it tested at a tribunal or court as of yet with respect to the vaccination policies. So uh, we're here to help navigate uh, employers and employees for those difficult times and, and those difficult conversations uh, and get their policies in place so that uh, you can ensure that your employees are protected as well as your customers. So I don't know, Cheryl if, uh, or, or Michelle, if you have stuff to add to that. So We'll go to Cheryl next. I, I know that uh, Josh, we put out some uh, uh, content recently on uh, policies and that kind of stuff. So I'd, I'd say to people to go to our, uh, the Chamber website, and you can dig that, uh, that content down. We'll provide links to it later on if you like. Uh, but Cheryl, what's the uh, the HR perspective on this? Yeah, uh, well, thank you again as well to the chamber for for having me today. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, you know, not much further to what Josh was was stating um, in terms of what we're seeing. Certainly, a number of our clients that we're dealing with um, are rolling out vaccine policies. A number of them are actually leaning towards mandatory vaccine policies. Um, and so we're helping our clients work through those. I think what is probably critical for you, if you are uh, in the process of or, or are doing a, a vaccination policy within your workplace, is you really need to think about, um, you know, does it make sense? Because I think if these things get challenged down the road, it's, it's going to come down to a couple of factors. One, are you a high risk setting? Because it is mandatory in high risk settings right now, hospitals, long term care homes. Um, group settings, uh, you know, uh, ch some childcare facilities, those types of, uh, of things we're seeing um, now mandatory vaccination requirements for lots of doctors and nurses. I'm sure you're reading all the news about uh, all of that, that that's coming in force and whether or not these individuals who don't get vaccinated end up being laid off or terminated, that remains to be seen. But I think you have to look at the nature of the work that you're doing, what industry sector you are in, is it high risk, does a policy to put mandatory vaccinations in place make sense? 
Um, you know, are employees able to physically distance? Can they work from home? Um, what is the nature of the work that they're doing? What other protocols do you have in place? And I also think it's important to keep in mind a, a vaccination policy is different from a mandatory vaccination program. So um, you can have a vaccination policy in place. That doesn't mean that you have to mandatory or make mandatory that all employees get vaccinated. Um, and there is a difference. Um, so some clients of ours are making the mandatory um, vaccination uh, in their workplaces. Others are just saying, look, we encourage people to get vaccinated. And if you're not going to get vaccinated, then you may be subject to random testing or testing twice weekly uh, because we do have an obligation under the Occupational Health and Safety Act to ensure every reasonable precaution with respect to the health and safety of our workers. And that is paramount. So, um, you know, there's lots of options around, as Josh mentioned, you know, if there's a reasonable ground to accommodate someone, absolutely. Can you ask for medical documentation to support that? Yes. Can you ask for proof of vaccine? Yes. Can you ask for vaccine status? Yes. So all of those things you are allowed to ask, but I, I think it's critical for you as an organization to think about whether or not a mandatory vaccine policy makes sense in your workplace. Um, so the, the, just a couple of initial thoughts from me, I can turn it over to Michelle and, and certainly we can answer more with some questions that come in. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, so great perspectives, but one that we haven't really added in and, and Michelle I think brings up a great point is, it's wonderful to have all this stuff, but if we don't communicate it properly, um, that that's really where it falls down, and I, and I think that's you know societally that that's where we're running into issues. So Michelle, maybe you can help us figure out Absolutely. how to get this down the pipe right the right way. Thanks for inviting me to chat about this. So certainly, when I think about what I've heard is, we want happy customers, we want safe and happy employees, and there is a big role that communication plays in that. And I think what I'd like to sort of plant seeds with all of the owners of businesses who are listening is. You got to get proactive from that standpoint of communicating. So you need to, you know, your staff need to understand what the law is asking you to do. You know, you need to let your team know how you're going to be running that in your business. So as Cheryl was mentioning, you know, are there policies, are there, you know, requirements, make sure that those are all clear, you know, and then the other proactive part is, you know, helping your customers know a little bit in advance because you've got so many places to let them know. So if you have a database with emails, you can let them know that you're following the rules that the government is requiring you to follow. This is what it's going to be like coming to your organization. You can use signage you know, outside your establishment and inside your establishment, clear, concise language to talk about how you're implementing what's required of you. This doesn't mean you have to share your personal opinion about whether any of this is wrong or right, because you're being asked to do it by the, by the law, depending on the business that you're in. You've got a website, you've got social media. There are, you know, are ways to communicate what you're doing and how your environment is going to be impacted in advance so that your customers, clients aren't getting a surprise when they get there. Having said that, you also need to be prepared for that reaction. You know, you need to have a few tools in your toolbox for your employees that help them, whether it's you've developed some messages, some, some statements that they can make when an irate customer comes and, and is blaming them for the government making this rule a requirement. You know, if you have got some messages that your staff can lean on, they don't have to think of it off the top of their head. They know that this is the right way to answer that. The other thought I had, and maybe this leans to some thoughts Cheryl can add is, you know, what is your escalation process? You know, are you going to let your 18 year old frontline staff worker get in an argument with a really irate customer? There's a lot of emotional trauma there and, and they're being asked to, to do something that's far outside of the scope of just doing the job they were probably hired to do. So I think that, you know, if they've said these messages twice in a calm way that they're doing what the law requires, and what the organization and company is doing, they need to be able to pass that to somebody else who then is also prepared with the right messaging. You know, business owners aren't making the most of these decisions. We're just enforcing them. So uh, it, it, it's that idea of, you know, can you put some tools in place for your team, even put some tools in place for yourself? Because there's nothing worse than being caught on the spot and you don't have an, an, a reply ready 
and you end up getting argumentative accidentally and it, it just becomes uh you know it fuels it so my idea with this getting proactive and then being prepared to react is to diffuse the situation if those things don't work at some point you're just going to have to refuse that customer but it really you know looking at who's doing that and what is the way that you're doing it because it's not actually about you and your business it's about the fact they don't like this legislation so yeah. that's sort of my little take on a couple pieces to think about and i'm happy to take questions as we go through this yeah I, I'm, we've got a couple questions in there so Excellent. we'll just let those uh, percolate so please if you have questions get them in there I mean, I mean we're experiencing this you know every single every day at the at the chamber you know, we're developing a policy ourselves because we're an event space um, when we have our board meetings and when we bring in uh, you know groups that rent our spaces out so we're trying to figure that out but we're also in the public doing ribbon cuttings there's lots of different events where you know we want to make sure that our staff are protected or they're at least abiding by the, the, the rules and policies that are out there so it's it's a bit of a box of darkness to a certain extent but you know um, and one uh, miss word in a policy um, you know and you're and you've got yourself into some issues so uh, certainly, you know, use use the professionals that are at your disposal to review it and make sure that you're on the right track. So with that, uh, does anyone have anything to add as we start to get into some questions in here? Yeah, just to add to what Michelle was saying, she raises a really good point about having, you know, the 18 year old host or hostess working the front uh, with an irate customer. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is, or employers don't realize that you have an obligation under the Occupational Health and Safety Act to provide a safe, and work, safe work environment free from harassment. And that includes harassment from customers or clients or, you know, members of the public. So if you have, you know, you have to have a plan in place to deal with that. Otherwise, te technically you're in, in breach of your obligations as an employer under the OHSA. You know, it, it, arguably it's not fair. Uh, it's not fair or legal to have that 18 year old having to deal with that onslaught of, of public complaint about a policy that they had nothing to do with. Right. Mm -hmm. So there is an argument to be made there. I've, yeah. I've and, and if I could just comment further too. Michelle, I think you raised an excellent point. And further to Josh, I was, was going to allude to the same thing. You know, certainly in policies that we're developing, and even we've been developing COVID-19 handbooks for our clients, um, communication is critical. And we actually recommend that you have a COVID response team in your um, COVID handbook or your COVID protocol, um, however you want to call it, which is a designated individual that these individuals can go to. Um, who's educated, who has the answers, who can set the direction, uh, certainly communicate to whoever via email, in person, whatever the case may be. Um, and further to Josh's point, um, all of the policies that we're developing for our clients as it relates to a, a vaccine policy in the workplace, there is a specific section on um, ensuring that the employees are and customers for that matter, um, are adhering to your respect in the workplace policy. And this even extends to employees not ridiculing other employees uh, about their vaccine status, uh, calling other people out for their vaccine status or talking any kind of political talk about anything related to the vaccine or their opinion of it. Um, you know, you really wanna hold employees to that standard as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think both Michelle and Josh raised good points in terms of that that communication and and having a key point person to go to is key, and and always an, ensuring that the employees are reminded that at the end of the day they they do need to follow and respect each other. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, these are the, the real things that you know businesses are facing. It, mm -hmm. it, it the, the overarching policy they have no control over, but they do have a control over what happens in their in their space. And, and these are the yeah. things that they're fighting, especially when you're short staffed. How, how, do you, how do you manage this when you can barely get enough staff on the floor to serve your customers? Now you're, mm -hmm. now you're starting to actually add the complication of having decreased service because of your staffing levels with irate customers that are already elevated when they come in and then you're serving them slowly. It's not, it's just a recipe for a disaster. So anyways, let's, uh, let's get, get on to the, <laughs> to the questions here. Um, my employees have uh, uh, must have particular, um, particularly rare and specialized skill set. I have two that refuse the vaccine based on personal choice. I can't replace them if they leave. What are my choices? Uh, do you want me to respond, Josh, or you? Uh, go for it, yeah. I can go for it. <laughs> go for it, Cheryl. <laughs> you can correct me from a legal perspective. Um, so what are your choices? I mean, first, first choice, I think, is to look at whether or not those individuals can do that work remotely. 
um, would be probably the first thing I would say. I think you need to look at the actual industry. I'm not sure what industry it is or what the actual position that those individuals are doing. Because I, I do feel if, you know, if you did move to terminate them or, or uh, transition them out of the company at some point, that is going to be something that is going to probably come back and, and ask you if you considered. Um, granted, there's a lot of positions that can't be remote. So if that's not an option, um, you know, then maybe you can look at some other things. Is there a different position that they can do? Is there something else? Is there a way to have them work in the office um, environment um, with enhanced protocols in place? You could certainly ask them to be screened twice weekly through the rapid testing. Um, so there are some options with respect to that. Um, if and I do have some clients that are putting those procedures in place and I even have the employees refusing to be tested. So what are your options? Well, you can put the policy in place and it's up to the employee whether or not they wanna follow the policy. Um, so, you know, you certainly can look at other alternatives and then sort of work, work from that end. And a, a personal preference, as Josh pointed out earlier, the Human Rights Commission released that document um, where it was made very clear that that is not a reason to accommodate individuals under the human rights code. So if an employee does say to you that you are violating their human rights from that perspective, you are not. Um, so personal preference is not something that you are obligated as an employer to accommodate under the code. Um, and look at, I think at the end of the day, everybody can respect everybody's personal decision, but you have to make a decision as an organization. And I, I was saying this to Josh earlier, you know, it's not about forcing an employee. I think, Michelle, you even said it. It's not, people are just upset with the legislation. That's what it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's not about forcing someone to get vaccinated or forcing them to take a test, but you can enforce your policy, E-N-F-O-R-C-E. So if an employee chooses not to follow your policy, what are your options? I guess your option is to tell them they don't work there any longer. And I'm, I'm Josh, maybe you can speak to this a little bit, but I don't believe that would be a termination decision. I would believe that would be an employee not following a policy, just like any other policy, and, and they have chosen not to work there. So, uh, you know, that would be of their decision, not not something that you would turn around and terminate them for. We're, we're going to see a lot of uh, argument over that, I think, over the course of the next few years with respect to is it resignation, is it job abandonment, or is it insubordination in their mm -hmm. for, for for termination for cause? It, you know, and I think we're going to see the case law develop over the course of the next two or three years in that regard, and interpret COVID policies. And I think, you know, there's not going to be a one shoe uh, fits all or one size fits all. It's going to be, um, you know, was the policy reasonable? Was it necessary? Uh, was it enforced reasonably? Uh, was it enforced in good, good faith? Um, was it communicated? Was it communicated? <laughs> which is right? an important part, right? And, mm -hmm. and so we're going to see a lot of that come out. But Cheryl, you hit the nail on the head there. It's up to the employer to decide whether or not they want to have this policy in place and, and enforce it. Uh, what I would caution, though, is if, you choose, if you're worried about losing staff because of having a COVID-19 vaccination policy or a policy um, in that regard, and you choose not to, well, what about your other employees? Are your other employees going to then make a claim of, you know, for uh, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act for not having a, a safe work environment for them? Are they going to have concerns as well? So it's re really a tough spot for employers to be in right now. Um, but what I would what I would caution is you want to look at this pragmatically as well. well how do your other employees feel? Um, you know what you, what could happen if you decide not to go forward with a uh, a policy to keep your employees safe, whether it be through mandating vaccines or having some sort of hybrid, and someone gets sick. At, at your workplace and, uh, you know, and it gets really sick and misses time or, or worse. Um, you know, what is your exposure there? If it's found that you could have acted more reasonably in having a, some sort of policy in place that a policy was available to you. So there's a lot of different, um, you know, factors that would go into making that consideration, but, you know, certainly you want to be mindful of the, of the, you know, the concerns that some of your employees have with respect to getting the vaccination, make that determination and work with them to make the determination whether or not it's on the basis of a valid, you know, code protected reason, um, or if it's, you know, or if it's based on personal belief and communicate, you know, the importance of ensuring that the workplace remains safe for everyone and, uh, or come up as Sharmesh come with alternatives as well. 
but I ultimately it's up to you. Yeah. Add something in there from a communication standpoint, and it revolves around the idea of issues management. Because what I hear in in what you're saying is, you know, as an employer, you're juggling a lot of things because you have a reputation that you're trying to manage, and it's not just the reputation between you and your customers. It's between you and your employees, and and all of and you and your suppliers. So you know, I feel like there's that risk management piece when you're looking at what's the right policy. You know, a policy is only as good as enforcement. You know, if your enforcement of it is so um, harsh, that can come back and burn you from a communication standpoint in public relations. Because if you have a lot of disgruntled employees out there, they're not talking good things about your company that you've built. So, you know, all of this uh, is, is navigating some fine lines, but I think it's definitely worth taking time to think about these things in advance before you have to deal with it. Because if you do have to, have an employee and they're not going to be able to stay with you, you need to think about, you know, is there going to be a backlash? Do I have to answer to a call from media going, uh, my, this employee just said that you let them go because of this and they think it's a human rights violation, which you know it is not. But, you know, again, that idea of being proactively ready for some of those worst case scenarios from a communication standpoint is, is worth giving some thoughts to make a couple of notes around those things. So you're hopefully never have to use it but if you do, you have a way to talk it through. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, the first best way is always to talk to your people and understand where they're coming from. I mean, I mean that's the basis before any policy, um, you know, is that communication piece with the individual. Quite often you can find an accommodation with them that's that's good for both of you that it will fit within mm -hmm. all those parameters um, and, and use that as a starting point. Uh, so there's a question on the other side of this. Um, can you ask an, uh, an applicant uh, for an office environment or for any environment for that matter um, about their vaccine status during the interview process? So uh, I don't think you can. I, th I think that's one of the things where you state your policy um, and let them, that. Yeah, yeah. let them know that that's a condition of employment, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and we have been doing that for our clients. We do a lot of recruitment for our clients. Um, and so my recommendation to you would be at some point during the interview process, either if you do a telephone pre-screen or you get someone in person or virtually having an interview with them, you let them know that you have a policy in place and that such policy will require a double, like a full vaccination, if that's your policy. So you just let them know at the interview stage, the same as you would let them know the dress code or hours of work or what they're gonna be making, any of those things that you're gonna have in conversation with them. But to your point, Paul, you're not gonna ask them for their vaccine status until you extend an offer of employment. And the offer of, the, of, the offer of employment uh, should read, this offer is conditional upon the following. Typically it's uh, reference checks, background check, could be a credit check if you are hiring someone in an accounting position. Um, and then you can add certainly a, a bullet point that says proof of a full vaccination status. Um, but you, you need to make sure that that offer is extended conditionally first before asking of that. But there's no reason why you certainly couldn't disclose during the interview process that that is a requirement. And in fact, we have done that with some of our candidates on the phone, and then they have willingly told you oh, that's okay, that's fine, I'm double vaccinated. And they're like, oh, okay, great. Uh, and some of them have said, well, no, I have no intention of getting vaccinated. And then you can quite frankly, cut the conversation off right there if you like. Yeah. Um, so, so you find some way during the process just to let them know that that's your policy. You're not asking them for anything, you're just letting them know. Exactly. But certainly don't ask uh, for a disclosure until you extend a conditional offer of employment. Good. Um, so we're going to go to the, the religious side of this. There's a question in here. If an employee claims a religious exemption, what proof would they have to provide uh, for an employer to accommodate? I know that Josh had mentioned this um, prior in a prior uh, webinar, but it's hard ground to hold up. So what's the what's the proof of status there? Well, I think it's really important to, to note that not all beliefs uh, amount to a creed that's protected under the code. Uh, so, it, but the code, the, the issue is the code, the human rights code doesn't actually define what a creed is. Uh, so they've come out with a policy on preventing discrimination based on creed, which sets out some of the guiding factors that they've based on 
uh, cases that have come before it in the past or, you know, in the in the Superior Court of Justice or all their tribunals and courts. So it's a sincerely, freely and deeply held belief that is integrally linked to a person's identity, self-definition, fulfillment, which is part of a particular uh, and comprehensive overarching system of belief that governs one's conduct and practices that addresses the ultimate questions of human existence, including ideas about life, purpose, death, and existence or non-existence of a creator and or a higher or different order of existence, which is somehow connected in some way to an organization or community that professes a shared system of belief. So uh, a, a singular belief or personal preference against vaccinations or masks does not appear to be a protected ground under the code. And that was issued in the uh, human, right, uh, human Rights Code um, or Commission rather in their policy statement. Uh, so really, you know, what you're going to require is a letter from you know, a religious leader in that person's, um, you know, is for spiritual leader in that person's belief system, outlining the reasons why they don't believe in the vaccination, uh, as well as uh, that it's commonly accepted in that religion or that religious sect that, uh, you know, that proposes that vaccinations are not to be had by their, uh, you know, by their adherents. So it's a really difficult thing for, for people to prove, um, you know, and, and to comply with. And it's again, we're seeing it a lot because, you know, people's personal beliefs on, you know, are not protected under the code. It's, it's got to be kind of an overarching system of beliefs from a, you know, with a like-minded group. So, you know, that's, that's why we're, I stated it's going to be hard to prove, but yeah, ultimately I think in order for someone to succeed on that, they need to provide some sort of documentation from their spiritual leader or religious leader in, in that regard. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really sticky one for uh, uh, employers to deal with. I mean, again, you're becoming a cop um, and a lawyer when you're really just trying to sell hamburgers. I mean, it, it's that's that's the overarching problem with this uh, this whole system at the yeah. moment. Um, you know, I, another question, and we'll answer this really quickly: is a mandate a law? You know, as per our other thing, wouldn't you can go back and have a look at it. a mandate is a law? I mean, it's a it's a regulation. A regulation is a law. Um, simply stated, Josh, you probably give a more lawyerly viewpoint on that but i mean the bottom line is it's the law right yeah so mandate is so there it's it's passed by the order and council with respect to i mean for example the mass mandate that was passed by by the provincial government uh, a regulation uh, through a regulation right so the ontario regulation for reopening ontario uh, mandated several things the regulation is a, a law passed by the cabinet uh, of, of the government Okay. Um, another question. Are there any free resources available to business owners to help formulate a COVID policy? That's the chamber. Yeah, we, we do have a boilerplate one, but again, you know, it's, it's going to be basic language based on somebody dreaming something up. I would look at it, see if it's applicable to your business. Um, and then I would seek professional help before you put pen to paper, to be honest with you. So, um, but we can certainly uh, have that. If you just contact uh, Julie or myself at the chamber, we can, provide that for you later on. We used one of those from another uh, chamber system as the basis of ours, and then we've been adapting it to, to suit our, our particular situation and the services we provide. Um, I'm not sure if, I'm sure I'm, Cheryl has lots of policies, but they aren't for free. <laughs> That's an option. <laughs> I was just gonna say you can call us, but yeah. Uh, and That's I'm not okay. sure, um, you know, certainly I think the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit put out a little guideline in terms of um, what should be included in policies. There's lots on the um, uh, actually other local public health units, or I think the uh, Peel region or one of them, Toronto, actually put something out as well. I mean, I think the government of Ontario even put a, a link out if you were to uh, go online and search there, just in terms of elements that should be included in your policy, there's about eight different ones. Um, you know, yeah. the reasons why privacy issues, you know, what, what, what is your policy, who, who the policy applies to for how long, when is it effective, those kinds of things. So um, yeah, obviously, Paul, you're a great resource for that. And then there probably are some other, I don't, I haven't seen any templates per se, but there are guidelines um, so for, for things that should be included in the policy. Yeah, and the Ontario Chamber put out a Vax Pass uh, tenant, which is, you know, just a, basically a guideline that's business forward. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, I actually have a, a template that you can take a look at. Um, but again, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying this is a template that was created and you can look at it and um, use it at your, uh, at your, at your own 
you know, mm -hmm. discretion for, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, um, like to just add something in there to think about though, is that, you know, a policy that's written is a lot different than you talking about that and engaging and enacting that with your staff and your team. You know, right. I think it comes back to really solid leadership and how you're communicating with your team and, and building that relationship because you're actually putting in effect a policy that, you know, might go against what you personally believe, but the government is making you in this position. So mm -hmm. I think that, point. you know, yeah. a policy is only as good as the people who will follow it and, and, and they need to follow your lead. So I, I still think, you know, that internal communication piece where you're really having good dialogue with your team about why the policies come about, what the purpose of the policy is, you know, whether there's any kind of strike one, strike two, I don't know. But, but I think those are relationship builders that you need to keep in place. You know, you also don't want to alienate all of your team. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Typically, or you know, uh, theoretically, for a policy that could be out, you know, um, when the government makes this not a mandated um, issue, right? So you, you got to be careful. I, I was related back to sort of strike situation. You know, you're <laughs> you're you're battling with people to to find agreement on a contract. At the end of the day, you're gonna have to go back to work with them. Um, and and if and if you've uh, damaged relationships along the way. Um, they take a lot longer to repair. So it's better to have uh, people cooperating than, than not. Um, I have clients, uh, we'll leave that one alone, sorry. Um, sorry, we've already covered it. So does a, uh, here's an interesting one. Does a COVID outbreak in the workplace that leads to a staff having a long-term effect um, acknowledged as an occupational illness under the Occupational Health and Safety Act? Sorry, what was that question again? Does a COVID Does outbreak? A COVID outbreak in the workplace that leads to a staff member having a long-term effect, uh, having, having long-term effects acknowledged as an occupational illness under the, under the Occupational Safety Act. So I guess what they're asking is if there was an outbreak in the office, they got COVID, they have long-term effects. Is, is that something that's now a part of um, a, a long-term illness claim? Well, certainly there's... Um, you know, it's already been defined that COVID is an occupational, uh, is an ill, right, is an occupational hazard, if you will, um, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, by definition, it would be included as, as one of those. Um, so in terms of if an employee gets COVID and then there's long-term effects, we already know that COVID, um, you know, employees can try to apply for WSIB benefits. For COVID, um, you know, it's up to the adjudicator, uh, obviously, whether or not they would approve those benefits. I don't know, Josh, if you've seen anything in your practice uh, about that or anything uh, in terms of those de decisions being challenged. Um, but certainly, you know, from an HR perspective, it's something that um, the WSIB will consider. And so um, if, if an employee does get COVID and does lose time, you know, you can apply for WSIB benefits, and then we'll, you know, leave it up to whether or not they approve it, depending on the circumstances in which the employee contracted COVID, and whether in fact, you know, it was related to the workplace. I haven't had too many clients actually that that has happened to, um, but I, you know, I know that the WSIB has put something out in terms of it being covered as an occupational illness for, for, for the purposes of collecting benefits. Right. Is the company liable if they haven't done their due diligence in, in protecting employees with a policy or practices? Um, I, do you have a comment on that, Josh? Like, yeah. I, I don't. Yeah, no, I would I would suggest that um, there is exposure if, if you don't mm -hmm. have a, uh, a policy in place. I, I mean, the issue is there's a lot of measures that can be taken to protect your employees. And right. if you don't, if you, and it's required under law or by the Occupational Health and Safety Act to provide that safe uh, work environment for your employees and COVID is recognized as a threat to that safety. Right. Uh, you know, and if you fail to take steps to protect your employees by implementing a policy, and we're not saying that you have to implement a mandatory vaccination policy. Uh, actually, I think we're saying the opposite. You don't have to, but you need to have some sort of policy in place to ensure that your employees are protected, whether it's a hybrid model through having testing or vaccination or remote. Uh, mm -hmm. But you need to have that policy in place to ensure that 
your employees have a, uh, you know, the risk posed to your employees by coming into the workplace are minimalized as much as possible. Okay. Yeah, in interesting <laughs> what comes up from these, uh, these situations, but a great question. Um, are there specific medical exceptions or can an employer just accept a doctor's note? Um, well, I can speak to that one a little bit, and then I don't know if the other panelists want to answer. Um, you know, I, 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 I really lean into what Michelle is saying in terms of communication. You know, I think you always have to have conversations with your employees about their reasons why. Why don't you want the vaccine? What are you afraid of? What, you know, how can I help you? Do you need more education, right? Have conversations with them and, and let's not always jump to conclusions. Um, you know, or assumptions rather about their reasoning without having that conversation with them. Maybe they are legitimately scared. I can, I can give you an example. I had a conversation with a client, one of their employees, um, a quite, took me quite a while to get to the root of it, but this employee was actually terrified of needles. I mean, he wasn't really afraid to get the vaccine per se, um, but, but terrified to the point where he's, you know, maybe seeking some therapy and some, some help with it. And so that's okay. So why wouldn't you accommodate that person? Is it a protected ground? No, but you know what? Just having that conversation with that employee helped that employee a lot significantly, right? So I think in terms of medical notes, um, you know, is he gonna get a medical note to say he can't get vaccinated because he's afraid of needles? Would you accept that? Probably not. But having the conversation with the employee and understanding their reason really can help you um, maybe assist that employee and grant them a little bit more time to make a decision. Um, I do think medical notes could be taken at face value. I do always recommend that to my clients. Take them at face value unless they're really non-descriptive. The employees, you know, and, and maybe that's the case. You might get a medical note that says so-and-so is exempted from the vaccine for medical reasons. Okay. Can you ask for more information? You can, but I think you have to ask why. What is, you know, have the conversation again with the employee. What is the reason why? What kind of position are they in? Maybe if they're in a, in, in a position where um, they're working with a lot of people very close by, they're in, you know, a, an area where, or a position where they can't physically distance, maybe you'll want more medical documentation to support that versus somebody that's in an office environment who can keep their distance, who can wear a mask, who isn't interacting with other people. I think you have to think about that when you're accepting these medical notes. You certainly can ask for more documentation to support it, but I think you've got to look at and have the conversation. Is, is it warranted? Yeah, and I guess you got to know. I mean, it's always the assuming innocence is, I think is always the best uh, approach, but I mean, I, if the note comes from a podiatrist, I mean, maybe you're questioning, you know, why a foot doctor's weighing in on a respiratory sure. issue. Yeah, I think you have to use common sense with it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Th there's a couple of there's a couple of questions in here along that as far as um, vaccine status and keeping records um, of a of uh, uh, you can't keep customers uh, uh, health records, but you can keep employees. Um, and I think we covered that once before. Uh, yeah, I guess you can keep the status of employees, but it has to be under lock and key, and you you need to be. Um, you know, maintaining that information in a very secure way. Um, but I think that's allowed. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, employees' privacy is, is important, right? But when it's coming in light of the consideration of, you know, the safety of your other employees, that's where it's kind of overridden it, to, a certain, to the least extent possible. But you can require that proof of vaccination status or proof of testing um, from your employees, as long as, again, you, like you said, Paul, you keep it under lock and key, you have a designated uh, health information custodian. Uh, some, some organizations aren't required to have it, but it's a good idea to have someone designated, usually your HR administrator or professional, uh, or if it, you're a small organization, you know, the owner of the business, um, you know, someone that you can trust to, to keep that information confidential without sharing someone else's vaccination status to their other employees, right? Uh, if and you also want to take steps that once this, uh, you know, the policy is no longer required to say we curb COVID, we get, you know, or there's some sort of resolution to this pandemic, fingers crossed, uh, you know, you, you can confirm with the employee that you'll be destroying the information uh, once that policy is no longer required. So, yeah, and certainly I can speak to that um, a little bit further 
with respect to the policies that we're doing for our clients. Um, we are actually recommending that once the proof is shown or known, it is, it is right then and there destroyed. Um, and so meaning um, an employee can show you their passport uh, or the QR when that happens. Um, they can show you the little white statement uh, that they got from the Ministry of Ontario. They can show you a picture. They can give you a scanned copy, whatever, the, whatever they want to do. Um, but the policies that we're writing will say as soon as that's received, it will be destroyed. Um, and all the, all the employer will do is actually just keep a record, meaning there might be a list of names and it'll say, okay, Paul, yes, Josh, no, Cheryl, yes, Michelle, no, right? Or it might say two X's for double dose, one X for one dose and second dose, whenever that happens, then there'll be a little tick box. So it's, and then it can really be kept almost in aggregate form. You know, you could almost say out of a hundred employees, 90 of them are double vaxxed and 10 of them aren't, right? Yeah. Um, so, so certainly the policies that we're writing, we're very mindful of the privacy. And again, I'll, I will defer back to Michelle and the importance of her uh, talking about communication. I think if that's communicated to the employees early, at, at early on in your policy development, how you're going to handle the privacy, how you're going to handle the, the disclosure and record keeping of that. You don't have to keep a copy of that white form in their file. You yeah. can just say, just show it to me on your phone even. I just need to see it. I don't even yeah. want a copy, right? Just show it to me. Yep, Paul, you're good. I tick you off and that's it. Um, are you, yes, I agree with Josh. There has to be a gatekeeper of that, if you will. Typically, it's somebody in HR. Maybe it's just a business owner. Maybe it's the CFO, whoever um, has a sort of a record of those individuals, both for contact tracing purposes and, you know, if, if other disclosures required, if you're sending your, your employees out somewhere, for example, and their um, clients are re, re reacquiring it. We're seeing that with a lot of our clients in the construction industry where their subcontractors are requiring that information. Again, it's, it's only being given an aggregate form. So I think if that communication goes out early, that might minimize a little bit of that hesitation with employees in terms of how you're actually keeping that information. Another piece just to add to that in the comms, you know, communications thought is I think it's important for you to understand how are you going to then work with the two employees that are not vaccinated and the other eight that are, because unless everyone's wearing a mask, there's a potential risk that they're transmitting COVID because they've, they've caught it. You know, again, everybody right now can transmit COVID, double vax or not, at least from what I understand science-wise. So I think every bit of communication that you can get in front of, and that's that proactive piece is making sure people understand how it's going to work and how it's going to affect them. Because this issue is about your personal health and wellness, unlike so many other workplace concerns and issues. You know, and, and, it's, and it's, you can't see it happening because it's mi microscopic. Yeah. So any way that you can communicate early and build that trust between you and your team, I notice a comment there, you know, any policy that's rolled out, people feeling comfortable talking about it starts with you. So yeah. if you have had, it, and maybe you haven't had it up until now, well, it's never too late to start, you know, mm -hmm. say, this is what we're looking at. I want to have a way to walk through it, to answer questions. I can do it in a group. We can do it independently one-on-one. -on -one, so you can feel at ease to ask me questions you might not want to ask in front of others. Right now, this communication piece is integral to making it through this because there's so many unknowns. Things are getting thrown at us every other day. Something's different you've got to communicate to get through it. Yeah, I, I think you know, use this as an opportunity to maybe improve your communication processes in your, in your business. You know, have an open door policy so that people can come in if they feel like there, there's an issue and, um, and have it not be hierarchical. So if, if you wanna go above your boss's head, then, then that's fine. Uh, you know, I, I've worked in those environments and it's very useful. Um, it needs to be trust established, obviously, but the other thing I think, you know, that's, a, that's really important along these same lines is that you need to be, hard on policy and soft on people. I mean, and, that, and that's like, because the policy has to be the policy. It, you need to have that standard as to what we fall back to when there's a question of what do we do and how do we, it's governance, really governance and how you run your business. But you have to be soft with people in terms of being, you know, um, able to allow them to have a life and, and uh, explain whatever their situation is. So um, it, great comments. And, and I'm going to take a box off here. 
because you answered one of the questions there, Michelle. Thank you. Um, and a lot of these are, are very similar. Construction company often has subcontractors on site. Can I ask them that their vaccination status before having them on the job? You have to have a policy. Is it federal, provincial? Is there mandates based on the job site? You know, those are all things that you need to consider. But I think we've we've answered that question to, to an extent, unless you guys have something uh, on the construction site you want to answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some of that uh, so far with, with our clients in the construction industry. I'm not sure exactly of the question, but our clients are getting letters from their uh, contractors. In other words, they're where their guys are going to, for example, and they're requesting, um, you know, that, that our clients' employees are vaccinated um, before they come on site. Now, again, you know, could be a hospital setting or it could just be that's their policy and that's what they're putting in place. Uh, I did have one client that some employees had a, a bit of a difficult time with that and, and did push back a little bit. Um, but from what I've seen, when you read, um, they're called an attestation document is what I've seen so far. Josh, I'm not sure if you've seen anything similar um, or Michelle, if you've had any communications with respect to that, but um, they're really just looking for the aggregate information. So if you're going to send me seven guys um, or girls, uh, for that matter, seven crew members, whatever the case may be, um, how many are double vaxxed, how many are partially vaxxed, and how many are, are needing accommodation. And so it, it's not even fully disclosing any kind of personal information, name or, or otherwise. It's just a, an aggregate number of data. Um, and it's the, it's the it's the company, so in this case, my client, that would say, yes, I'm going to sign this attestation and say of the seven uh, crew I'm sending you, you know, all seven are double vaxxed or two need accommodation or they've been tested or what have you. Um, and regardless, I would say of your policy in your workplace, you will likely have to follow the policy of the place where your employees are going. Right. Just a, a couple of things to add to what Cheryl's saying. She she's dead on there. Um, you know, there it's if a, if a contractor wants to mandate that, as long as there again is accommodations for you know recognized reasons under the code uh, with respect to vaccinations, that's entirely within their prerogative to do so. But as an employer, just say you're the sub trade and your GC is requiring you to disclose this information. You have to be careful uh, with respect to your employee's confidential information as well, because then you're disclosing it to a third party mm -hmm. and you might not have the consent to do so. So, you know, the attestations that I've seen are similar to what Cheryl has seen. And there's a reason for that is because, you know, they're, they're treading on the line there of asking for information sufficient for their purposes without treading too far and getting confidential information about their subcontractors employees. Hmm. So along, along those same lines, um, how does a policy affect an employer that rents space from venues where they're not uh, an employee of that establishment? Can you say that again? How does a policy affect an employer that rents space from venues where they're not an employee of that establishment? So, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to explain this. You know, if, if the chamber is sending somebody out, let's say, and I'm just using us as an example, and we have a vaccine mandate policy and they're going into an establishment um, that doesn't have a policy, you know, can we? Uh, oh, in reverse. Yeah. So you're talking about, yeah. Before you send someone to, you know, can, can the sub trade demand that the GC have a vaccination policy almost in, in that situation, right? Right. Oh, I get it. Okay, so it's the opposite of what we just described with the contractors, you mean? Yeah. I, I suppose you could refuse to send your, your employee, if that's the question, if, if where they're going doesn't require the same. Um, or the employee maybe could refuse uh, if they didn't feel comfortable. But again, you know, you have to have that communication, right? Why? What is their protocol? Are there other measures in place, testing, mask wearing, that kind of thing, if I understand the question correctly? Yeah, um, I mean, the argument comes back to following whatever the provincial mandate is. If I mean, if you're going into a restaurant and the restaurant 
you know, it falls under the provincial guidelines and you're just following the provincial guidelines. There's already yeah. massive things in place. I, I, think, yeah. I think we try to complicate this a little too much at, at times, right? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Like we all know with the restaurants, right? Yeah, it's well, mandatory you that you, you go in there, double vax, show your passport, but it's not mandatory for the employees that work there. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. But I mean, that's this is where oh. you know, Russia. I, I don't, I don't think the government mandating that is a good thing in in uh, particular. But if they have a duty to respect the health and safety of their employees, then they're hopefully going to put a policy in place on their own to protect them yeah. under that under that yeah. guideline. So, my, uh, anyways, <laughs> my advice on that too is you can always ask the uh, other provider what their policy uh, vaccination policy is. Yeah. Um, that you want to take steps to protect your employees. So, and you know that in, they're expected to comply with the public health, uh, you know, units um, minimal requirements, right? So PPE, uh, distancing, and whatnot. So I think you know you can't mandate it to anyone. Just like you can't require your employees to get vaccinated, you can't require employees of other organizations to get vaccinated. But you can, t you do have the obligation to, you know, follow due process and take diligent steps to ensure that your employees are protected. And I think making that inquiry certainly doesn't hurt. For sure. So on, on another uh, side of this, an employee that will not be uh, vaccinated because of personal choice, can the employer insist on a random test with positive results? Um, and in brackets, dismissal is not an option. Well, I, I, the answer to that, I would say, sorry, am I jumping in here, yeah, Josh? No, no, go ahead. Um, if an employee refuses to be vaccinated, um, you can absolutely require them to be tested. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, you uh, what we've seen a lot of times is is the hybrid model of a policy. So vaccination and or you know, if you if for whatever reason doesn't matter if it's personal creed or you just don't want to yeah. get it because you just don't want to get it or you don't have time, uh, then you know there's testing that's available and for a lot of employers that's fine and and that's acceptable, right? Because in an office environment, certainly you can distance and. You can yeah. uh, protect your employees in other reason, in other ways. So requiring all your employees to get vaccinated, otherwise they they're not able to show up to the office, might be a, a step too far in that case. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, what do I do uh, about dealing with irate clients who are causing a scene and saying uh, that I'm discriminating, even though I'm following the law? I don't know, Michelle, you want to jump in on this one? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Any irate customer is always a tricky situation. And uh, you know what I, what I call on you to be is a little bit patient with them because we know that this is upsetting so many people. It's dividing so many people. Uh, it kind of goes back a little bit to what I was thinking about is, you know, what is it you want to let them know and know that in advance before you have this irate customer and also make sure that it's not your you know, your frontline staff are not having to manage this, that you've taken that customer away from them and again, you're handling them. A lot of times they want you to listen. You're not gonna have any rebuttals to them really about, you know, the fact that they don't like this law. It, that's their opinion. Um, you know, at some point to me, that's where it goes from. If you can't diffuse it by listening, I'm, you're gonna hit a point where you're gonna have to refuse them to be there because they are disrupting your business. And, and unfortunately, you know, it may come to that. I think any business owner that has irate people, no matter what the issue, has to decide where do they draw that line. When is it? I've listened. I've told you the situation, which is not our responsibility. We are responsible to follow the law, and we're sorry yeah. that's affecting you this way. You know, and and you're going to have to. Obviously, we can't resolve this. I noticed that uh, you know the idea of you know referring them to the MP. Well. You know, if people want to make a political stance, they can find out where to go. I think that, you know, that's a little bit of a tongue in cheek answer. Really, the ultimate answer is that you're doing what the law is requiring. It yeah, isn't well, a personal I, it, choice. It's not a personal affront to that person. And, and you, you know, you invite them to stay provided that they can follow this requirement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know just in other, from a tongue in cheek standpoint, our MPs are, are very good at getting back to their constituents, but I don't think you're going to get it in a timely enough manner to make it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, if you're having a real problem, I would call it the, the cops if necessary, but not 911. <laughs> um, you well, know, and I, again, going back to further to what Michelle said, you know, absolutely. And it and it's a respect thing, too. Right. Hopefully every organization has a respect in the workplace policy, which you're also legally obligated to have in Ontario. 
um, assuming we're talking about Ontario, but most provinces across this country have similar legislation in place. You know, so so it, there's that piece too, right? You can uh, respect people's decisions; they can be upset, but but you are going to draw the line at you know uh, saying, look, at this is a respectful workplace, and we're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior or that kind of outburst. Um, you know, we've we've certainly had it happen with some of our clients being irate to the employees, particularly in the um, uh, position where these employees are providing customer service on the phone um, and, and customers being irate and, and everything else, too, or in person at a front desk kind of thing, um, requesting, you know, they fill out a questionnaire, for example. Yeah. So um, just turn them away as respectfully as you can. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if you keep your comments to, to the behavior of that irate individual and not mm -hmm. their personality or whatever their belief system is, I think you're, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to argue when you're saying you're, you're, you're acting in a way that's just not appropriate um, than saying, hey, listen, you're an idiot and you need to stop. I, I, don't, I think you're just going to fight in that you case. Know, case it's, right? it's, that, it's that customer service communication 101. It's just that right yeah. now we're all amped up over this. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's really hard exactly. to keep our personal responses separate yeah. from that. But it's, you know, I hear you're upset. I can appreciate you could be upset by this. Yeah. You know, and, and if that type of listening and bouncing it back isn't working at some point, there is going to be, if this is on a phone, I mean, I've had, you've heard people of like, you know, if you're going to continue swearing at me, I am not going to have a choice but to disconnect this call. You know, it's no different, regardless of what the issue is. You've got a standard of how you're interacting with customers that you'll let that treatment of your team. Yeah. It doesn't change. It's just that I feel like we're seeing this more frequently. People are upset with the law, upset with this whole situation, and it's just uh, making it that much trickier. But just just mm -hmm. be calm, implement those those techniques that you have, and know that you need to jump in there and help your team out because they're not making these rules. They're just doing what they have to do. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, if you want an inappropriate comment, contact me off camera and I'll, I'll give you one. That's <laughs> you. Anyway, it won't do anything, but it's going to make you feel better in the long run. Um, <laughs> listen, I, I'd love to keep going with this because it really is a bit of a hot topic. And I can see by the fact that we still have, uh, you know, 20 people watching, even though we're a few minutes over time, tells me that uh, there's lots of interested parties. There's a few questions that weren't answered, but they were, they were kind of answered throughout the discussion. Um, if any of those individuals want specific answers, please uh, let us know and we'll make sure that we uh, reach out to our panelists and we'll get those answers to you. Um, but I want to thank you guys for coming today uh, and, and helping us uh, sort of clarify this. Um, I think both sessions that we've done have been very helpful. Um, and, you know, for, for businesses that may just be trying to find their way, I think the, the guidance is, uh, uh, is invaluable. So um, with that, I'm going to whip off to our closing here so I can get us the, back to the rest of our day. Um, mm -hmm. Again, thank you for, for coming today and thank you for doing what you're doing in your businesses every day. Uh, you know, to flatten the curve. I, I read somewhere today that we've actually flattened this fourth wave. Um, and that's outstanding news. Those numbers have stabilized and, you know, hopefully we're getting closer to some sense of normal normalcy. Um, yeah. You know, we've, we've got a couple of things coming up. We have a, a, on October 6th, we have a TD economist with us and he's going to uh, talk to us about a number of different things for, uh, you know, uh, with regards to the economy. And we haven't done one of those in a while, so I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, we have a chamber chat networking event, which would normally be on October 6th, um, but that TD update is going to be on October 13th instead. Um, so not in the normal week um, because of our economist. We're in the works of planning a BA5 that will be in person following all the guidelines on October 20th. Um, we're still, again, we're still in the detail uh, planning portion of that. So hopefully we can have some news on it really quickly. Um, check into our brand new website um, for more communication. If you haven't seen it, uh, please uh, have a look. And then what next week, um, or not next week, the week after is Accelerate Summit from uh, October 19th to the 22nd. Um, I encourage you to you know, go in and register, get a ticket. They're not that expensive. Um, and it's, uh, it's a great week of, uh, of learning. 50 speakers, uh, a number of different interactive uh, um, uh, events that are going to be happening throughout that week. Um, and it's a really great opportunity to uh, to get a bit deeper into your business. Michelle is one of our speakers uh, at that event. So uh, we're looking forward to her, her being there. And I think, Josh, are you part of that as well? I'm not, no. Not this year? Okay, well, you'll be, you'll, be, uh, you'll be dialing in to have a look. And I know that uh, Janice at HR Performance is going to be there as well. So 
Um, we, we are looking forward to that event. It's always a great one. So with that, I will say, and I'm just going to check the chat here because somebody sent me a message before I go. Uh, Richard Arden says, thank you uh, to the panel for insight and comments. Greatly appreciated. And Shay Reed said, thank you very much. It was a very good session. So there you go. A bit of positive feedback thank for you guys. Okay. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye.